Welcome everyone to today's CSIA Wednesday webinar series. My name is Colin Hammond and I will be your host today. From its start, CSIA was built on the principle of collaboration and with the goal to advance the industry of control system integration. In times of crisis, our members have turned to the CSIA community as a trusted source for advice and inspiration. In line with this, we have begun this Wednesday webinar series. Our goal is to help our community manage, survive, and hopefully thrive from the current crisis. We plan to cover a wide range of topics on coping and leveraging the current situation and have SI's vendor partners and special guests present. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are a global nonprofit professional association with over 500 member companies in 40 countries. Our mission is to advance the practice of control system integration to benefit our members and their clients. Our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low risk, safe and successful application of automation technology. CSI membership offers members access to resources needed to attain and exceed business goals. To highlight just a few of our many member benefits, the CSI best practice manual guides control system integration companies in the setup and running of a solid company. CSIA's business insurance program offers members an excellent insurance program for business owners, subcontractors, and more. The program includes members from all over the world enjoying peace of mind that comes with CSI insurance. Clients in all industries are now seeking integrators with a CSIA certification alongside ISO. They recognize CSIA certified integrators commitment to industry standards and business acumen. As a result, being certified can shorten the sales cycle. CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is the premier automation guide featuring system integrators and suppliers who provide industrial manufacturing and process automation solutions. For integrators and suppliers, it's a place to market their expertise. Clients will find white papers, case studies, capabilities, contact information, and engage in conversation directly with CSIA members. And please follow CSIA's online events calendars for all upcoming webinars. CSIA partner webinars are, are opportunities given to CSIA's industry partners to address hot topics and demonstrate their expertise. You won't want to miss these opportunities to learn from the comfort of your own office or home. And for more information about CSIA, please visit our website or contact us at info at staff.controlsys.org or 847-686-2245. And at this time, I would like to introduce Sam Hoff. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, Colin. Uh, you know, guys, I uh, grew up a huge baseball fan. Uh, Terry Crowley was a, a great pinch hitter for the uh, Orioles and Cincinnati Reds, and I'm pinch hitting for Jose today. Jose <laughs> is uh, on vacation uh, up north and in northern Michigan, which is a beautiful state and a state I call home. Um, so, um, uh, and because I'm on the uh, digitalization task force and help run it with Jose um, and, and help him line up speakers, um, I uh, um, am proud to introduce Jason. Jason is VP of Ecosystems at an edge orchestration company called Zadita. Prior to joining Zadita, Jason was CTO at a company maybe we've all heard of, Dell Technologies at Edge and IoT Solutions Division. His proven track record of thought leadership and in the market is evidence towards his leadership of building up an award-winning Dell IoT Solution Partners Program and establishing the vendor-neutral open source Edge X Foundry project to facilitate greater interoperability with the IoT Edge. Wow, that was a mouthful. <laughs> uh, Jason is a board member for LF Edge and is recognized one of the top 100 industrial IoT influencers in both 2018 and 19. He holds 14 pa granted patents and has 25 pending. Um, so, um, and, and before I hand it over to Jason, I think one of the things that we've discovered and, you know, Patty Engineering has kind of been on the leading and sometimes bleeding edge of these IIoT uh, projects is that um, uh, 
everybody forgets about the edge. And then how do you manage the edge? If you're talking to 300 machines on a plant floor, how do you manage the edge device that might be on all 300 of those machines? And I think um, uh, Zadita is really uh, tackling that well. And, you know, it's further proof of the merging of IT and OT. And as OT partners, we have to get on board because this is the way of the future. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Jason. All right, cool, great, thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine, Jason. Yep, you hear. Cool. Yeah, I'm popping up my screen here. All right. Um, can you see my screen now as well? Yep. Cool. Yes, sir. Yep. Great. Okay. Hey. Yeah. So thanks, Sam and Colin. So. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk through uh, various different considerations on how to, to build an ecosystem. So obviously that's my role at um, at Zadita. Um, you know, I dealt technologies, as Sam mentioned, got got the, the the ecosystem started there for IoT and Edge. Um, you know, EdgeX Foundry. We started from a blank sheet of paper and and um, in open source. It's it's been growing. So uh, blank sheet of paper in 2015, it just hit six million downloads. Um, out there in open source. And so we'll talk a little bit about this notion of, of open source helping to drive a network effect. Of course, we've got to all also make money. It's not about an open source free for all. It's where do you find that balance in between you know, openness and, and, and close and how do you scale into the real opportunities? So we'll kind of touch on a lot of that um, today. Um, you know, if, there's, uh, if there's questions, I don't know how questions are, are handled. Is it, is it chat or you know, can folks kind of chime in or? Yeah, so um, I put a, um, in the Q and A, if they want to put that in there, you'll um, just as they come up, I can uh, let you know when something's there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, so we'll just kind of get into it, but definitely ask questions. You know, keep it a little conversational. I've, we've actually got an event you know, right, right after this, so I'll have to wrap up by about um, uh, forty-five after the hour. But um, yeah. So been around the block with with the notion of building up ecosystems. Just kind of share some of the things that that, that I've noticed over the years. Um, and also, of course, there's this whole notion of of uh, you know, OT and IT converging. I, one of my pet peeves is, you know, everyone says, well, IT does this and OT does that. And it's not, you know, really the case. But what I do know, it's a lot easier to teach an OT person IT tricks than the other way around. You know, that domain knowledge is so, so important and whatnot. So, and we'll get into that as well. So, really important um, to kind of collaborate across the board. So, this this is a, a, a just to kind of level set a little bit, this is a, a diagram. I'm not going to go through all the details. Um, there's a new white paper from LFEDS, uh, you know, the open source umbrella organization within Linux Foundation. Um, EdgeX Foundry is in, in um, LFEDS now. Uh, the sister project to EdgeX, or a sister project to EdgeX, Project Eve, which is the base of the Zadita offer, uh, that's also in LFEDS. So, you know, I've Part of the reason I came to Zadita is I, you know, I, I really believe in the notion of open, um, but also I can still kind of keep working on some of the same things with uh, you know, the Linux Foundation. So they've been a great partner in this. Um, but, but, but basically, it's a really good read. It's about, it's about 30 pages long. It gets into this in great detail. When you look at IoT, industrial IoT, you know, digitization, or you know, any of these things, there's a lot of buzzwords out there, obviously. A lot of people talking about you know, myopic visions and whatnot, and, and kind of mostly from their perspective. Uh, this paper really tried, and, and, and I had a very heavy hand in with the team uh, and that community shaping this paper, it really tries to get into the differences between uh, what someone on the operations side would care about versus someone on the IT side cares about. So, you know, kind of quickly summarizing, on the far right, you got massively scalable, you know, cloud-based data centers. Um, on the far left, you've got million or billions, eventually trillions of constrained devices out in the wild. Um, so constrained that they're, they're, it's embedded software. You, you, everything's kind of custom you know, on, the, on the left side. Um, we, we are seeing more and more compute because of the sheer amount of data. You know, some people talk about latency and we'll get into that, but a lot of it is the cost of moving data from the edge to the, to the back end that's driving it. Uh, you guys know from the controls world, you know, uh, control networks, networks have historically been isolated for a reason, you know, because you, you care about uptime and safety and whatnot. But the, the whole catch-22 with industrial IoT is how do you expose those those systems safely to, to broader networks? You know, that could even just be on-prem. It doesn't mean that it has to go to the cloud. I, if I was running a nuclear plant, I probably wouldn't connect it to the cloud, you know, willy-nilly, but, you know, that's me. Um, but it's about finding that, you know, balance of value and risk. So we're seeing more and more compute come left. Uh, the difference between the service provider edges, which is you know, you know, cloud players, telco service providers delivering you know, compute and, and resources to large numbers of people in a shared fashion, 
and the user edge, which is you know, enterprises, your, your factory floors, you know, an end user in their home or whatever, is, is they're separated by a last mile network. And this is a really good uh, big delineation because too many people talk about real time in, in IoT or whatever. Real time is super subjective. As you guys know, there's a big difference between real time and deterministic hard real time. You know, so latency critical applications will always, always, always be run on a local area network, never be run over a cell or whatever. Some people you know, talking about 5G are like, oh, you're, you're going to drive your uh, car from the cloud. Uh-uh, never going to happen. Will you augment the services for that car from the cloud? You know, augmented reality, heads up displays, you have two cars coming towards an intersection, it, it alerts you as an augment to the local controls, sure. You know, uh, Netflix's of the world, those are getting pushed to the access edge right at the end of the, the, the uh, service provider, you know, right at the tower, right at that edge to reduce latency and congestion. You get a better experience, but no one's gonna die if you can't watch Tiger King, you know, <laughs> like you have to, you know, from Netflix or whatever, but you must do latency critical at the edge. So the net being is that as you go further and further left, you're getting more and more complex complexity. The on-prem data center edge still uses basically the same tools as you have to the right. Um, you know, the VMware's of the world, Nutanix is, Kubernetes is coming down. So there's all these different tool sets. Very key is once you get out of a physically secure data center, you know, to the left, uh, we called it the smart device edge because it includes PCs, tablets, you know, phones, you know, client devices, and it also includes, you know, headless gateways and servers and things like that for more of like IoT use cases. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the control systems and, and all that, your SCADA and, and, and the like. Um, the phones and the PCs, well-solved problem. iOS, Android, there's huge ecosystems built around it, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The headless devices, you know, gateways, hubs, routers, servers out in the wild, it's a mess. And so a big thing of what we're trying to do with LF Edge is how do we stabilize that mess? You can focus on value versus having to you know, reinvent the foundation. And that's gonna be another big part of the conversation today. So basically that smart device edge, the IoT component is um, uh, memory constraint on the left, under 256 megs of memory, you can no longer do uh, uh, abstraction for containers or virtualization. On the right, it's like a small server cluster sitting on a manufacturing floor to do something around you know, workload consolidation for you know, vibration analytics or, or you know, some sort of computer vision for worker safety or whatever. Uh, and then once you get one more click to the left, the constraint device edge again, everything's super, super custom and, and it's, it's like death by a thousand cuts you know, and, and whatnot. So simply put, so that's the spectrum. The white paper goes into a lot more detail, but uh, our company is focused on doing for the IoT uh, component of that smart device edge, what you know, a VMware Nutanix is doing, you know, up, up upstream, or any of the, the the great companies doing stuff upstream, outside of a physically secure data center, but still capable of running apps, uh, but doesn't have the ecosystem of an iOS or or an Android and whatnot. Uh, our foundation in LF Edge is basically think of it doing for um, uh, you know the these devices what Android did for mobile. So we'll get into it. So just just some context I think is important, and of course we'll get at least a lot more around the the, the notion of open ecosystem. Uh, we, we have a cloud-based console. We use the open foundation from LF Edge so you don't get locked in. Um, we help you or, uh, orchestrate compute with your choice of apps and, and hardware and, and cloud or on-prem system. doesn't matter. We're not in the data path at all. Easy button, you know, scan a QR code, you get secure dial tone go. So a lot more detail online. I don't want to make this an advertisement for us, but um, you know, it's, it's, we're approaching a very specific edge. So first and foremost, when you talk about edge, you got you to gotta talk about which one and why. Um, so this is just a view, I mean, you should look familiar, you know, it's, it's kind of the Purdue model, the various different layers, uh, any of the IoT edge stuff that you see, like industrial IoT, it's really not going to go b b below level one. You know, you're going to, you're going to see it, that, that compute come down different types of you know, gateways or um, service gateways, a loaded term too, I, I know, edge compute nodes, uh, doing various functions, and we'll kind of talk through some of those functions to also provide context. Um, I have heard too many people on the IT world say, hey, I could help you manage your PLCs from the cloud. I just want to hide under the table, you know, to, to a bunch of folks that are doing operations. That's not going to happen. You'll see those secure overlays happening over. So uh, where are some insertion points, you know, for, for uh, compute in, in an, an industrial network? And of course, this is uh, within, uh, um, there's other permutations you know, out in the wild. So number one, I'm dropping in some type of device, you know, it's, it's a little bit more network centric, centric at this case, but to create segmentation across the network. And, you know, I, it's, obviously it's about defense and depth. So I'm dropping in, whether it's a gateway or a server, otherwise it's for secure proxy. Could be all on the OT network. It could be dividing the OT network and the IT network, uh, you know, as in the DMZ. 
The second one is maybe I'm dropping an appliance in, um, like we're working with a company called Nozomi, uh, probably familiar to a number of you guys. Uh, you know, we would virtualize Guardian, we'd put it on appliance, we'd put it at any point in the tiers, and then you get more granular control over what's going on in the, in the network. So that's the, the importance of domain knowledge, because they, they've kind of reverse engineered all the protocols out there, they know when, when there's anomalies in the behavior, and then they'll, they'll alert you. Number three is I'm deploying compute anywhere across the network, could be on the OT side, could be on the IT side, you know, shared doesn't really matter. This is about deploying compute to do various different degrees of workload consolidation for you know, historian, data analytics, et cetera. All of this, you know, the reason why I think it's important, one, it sets context, and two is you want to have solutions that, that allow you to deploy compute in various forms you know, across, across you know, layered networks, maintain you know, that need for uptime and safety, but also drive new outcomes. And you want to do it in a way that you, you're not stuck with one platform because there's so many different tools out there. You really want to have consistent infrastructure, consistent tools for orchestration and security. You choose what cloud you're going to work with. If you want to use one cloud, great, but uh, I'll talk about in, the, in advanced class, you're going to need to be able to work with multiple clouds. Um, but, but just you know, setting some context and kind of where things are uh, uh, lane, but you, you want to have tools as you in, invest in, in, you know, kind of dis digitization for your business with your customers that are very flexible because you're going to see a lot of different deployment patterns and then a lot of different applications and domain you know, expertise applied on top. And ultimately the domain knowledge is what wins, uh, not reinventing the plumbing. And, you know, just so, so we help orchestrate this kind of stuff just as a side note, but then with your choice of stuff, but, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of our role. We're not in the data path. We're not the domain experts. That's, that's, that's where the, 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 um, uh, the controls players, you know, come in. You guys have that history. Okay, so, so that's just set some context. So the new product mindset, I think a lot of folks are sort of getting out of this mindset that when I build something, an offer or a service, like the day that I offer it, well, there's, that's the lifetime value. That's, that's the value. Hey, here's my new product. Um, the new product mindset is you offer something and then the whole time that's out in the field, it's continuously getting better. Um, you know, new experiences for customers, you, you improve it, you stay competitive by, you build something, you learn from it, you just keep building it. It never stops. And the old mindset is here's a product. Oh, you want a new experience? Buy another product. Buy, buy this year's model. Not, not the way it's going to work long term. And so to get this cycle to work, and, and this is about continuous delivery of software. You know, there's this whole notion of cloud native principles. Now, uh, on the factory side, you know, on the, on the process side, uh, a lot of folks would rather not update anything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with Windows 95 till the end of time if the process is running. But, but ab above that, you know, process, if you, as you start adding more intelligence and start driving new efficiencies and outcomes, you need to be flexible to be able to kind of get into this cycle um, because it's just going to get harder and harder to differentiate over time as people start to get this network effect going. Um, as part of this, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to be part of an ecosystem, whether you build one or you buy one, be in one. Um, and then that's about that network effect and, and, and you can focus on value and then work with the right partners for um, uh, uh, different aspects of a solution. So how do you, you know, for an industrial IoT, how do you build an ecosystem? I think it's a critical point. This actually you know, was a, a good point. I, I, we were talking in the, the group that Sam and I work in, like an advisory board, and, and, and it was a great point. It's like, yeah, the way you do it these days is you start building that foundation into your offer. You build the philosophy into your offer. I mean, I think a lot of people have done this inadvertently. In the industrial space, the controls players, their, their, their ecosystem was lock you in with a proprietary protocol uh, for many years, and then that, that's, that's, that's the foundation of the offer. And then you just kind of, you, you have to keep coming back to the, to the well. Uh, but then with everything sort of becoming more about openness and you, with of course, OPC way and there's a bunch of other efforts coming, people are moving to this model of you win by merit, not lock-in. And so open is starting to kind of really come in. In any case, you want to think about an ecosystem these days as it's part of your offer. It's not something that you do after the fact, like you build a product and then you go try to find partners that can work with you with it you build a product with partnerships in mind. I think it's a big, big difference than what people have uh, you know, thought about in the past. So, you know, I, I use this as a, an example. I'm, I'm talking to my Apple earbuds. This is nothing against Apple. I got a bunch of Apple products, nothing against Android, but a lot of people you know, don't necessarily understand because you, you might get in, a, in an Apple bubble or something, open versus closed. There's various different degrees of open versus closed. There's open, open, open source, free for all, download it and do whatever you want. Then there's you know uh, an openness where you build um, you know an open core model and you have uh, stickiness around that where you differentiate. 
um, and but you still drive a network effect through that open core model. Um, then you have what I call a closed open, which means you've got APIs people can use, but uh, you don't uh, you leave them really open for for people to do additional things. So it's like you can do anything you want with it as long as you pay me money. You know that's that's closed open. And then there's super super closed and locked down like like the Apple ecosystem. But that that's a trade off. You you create a very curated experience. Maybe you give up some choice, but uh, you know the prices might be higher. But there's a curated experience. On the the Android side, it's a little harder to differentiate with the hardware because there's so many players doing it. But you know, look at you know, what Samsung's been been able to do with Galaxy. Uh, you can still build a network effect with an open model. But well, but the key is openness always breeds scale. So contrary to popular belief, globally, Android has close to 80% of the market share um, uh, for because of that that open model. Uh, Google makes tens of billions of dollars a year on the click through advertising and the Google Play Store and whatnot. So they're, they're certainly making money. They did not do Android just to be, be nice. You buy the little company Android and put it out there. So this is one of many examples, but this first step is to decide where do you want to land on the open versus closed scale? Um, you know, open always wins for, for, uh, for scale. Um, you know, there's, I think, room for both. And again, it's not just about a free for all. You must have some. Everyone, everyone has some degree of closed, you know, aspects. But it's just, it's just something to think about. Open source software, con con very um, misunderstood in certain spaces, where open source, oh, that's not secure. Actually, open source has proven to be more secure because you have so many eyeballs on it in terms of that foundation. Uh, there's a reason why you know Microsoft bought GitHub. You've got your know, Facebooks and all these huge, you know, uh, you know companies, and, and increasingly OT companies starting to adopt open source. Uh, I picked up this term. I, I can't. It was I think at an oil and gas conference, someone that was really into open source at, a, at an oil company. But like this notion of uh, uh, you know open source is to avoid undifferentiated heavy lifting. There are way too many people reinventing the middle. It is not important to to, to reinvent the middle. It, it, it's not valuable. Uh, a lot of IoT platforms are trying to to own everything. But when you do everything, you never do one thing really well. And so, so what I think it's important is it's not, you know, it's not saying just go adopt open source and you're done. It's just consider leveraging shared technology investment so that you can focus on value for your customers. And in long term, the people that get ahead, the winners are going to be building necessarily unique hardware and software on top of uh, open infrastructure. They're going to have domain knowledge, domain knowledge rules. Uh, they're going to be offering great services. Um, it is not about the plumbing. You know, uh, imagine if the internet was not open, um, but but the I, Internet of Things has been super closed. Even though that's kind of a new way of doing things, of course that's a a step up from the the, the way industrial has worked for a long time. So times are changing. So it's really important to kind of step back and think about as you build up your strategy, where you're working with your customers, where do you want to be on that that spectrum? Uh, the other thing I always joke about. So if you, if you've ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, the dad sprays uh, Windex on everything. Oh, you got to cut. Just put some Windex on it. You know, so, so there's a lot of Windexes of technology, I call it 5G, AI, uh, digital twin, whatever, all important trends, don't get me wrong, but what you don't want to do is just be throwing around words just because they're, they're you know, buzzwords. It's a thing to say, Kubernetes, oh, Kubernetes will go everywhere. Just put six Kubernetes on it, you're good. All very important, but you really want to start, and you guys know this, you want to go solve problems, focus on outcomes, and then back in the right technologies, but it's still these technologies are easier to apply when you create some sort of network effect around a core because it's it's really messy and so if you create a groundswell especially in the in the open sense where you get more people working on how things come together it gives you the time to go focus on stuff uh you know that, that creates value for your customers so that undifferentiated heavy lifting again it kicks in it's like if you spend a bunch of time reinventing the wheel you've got no time left to, to differentiate and, and I, I just see it all the time, uh, people reinventing the wheel right now in, in, in IoT. I, I think that doesn't mean that the industry you guys are in today, but it's like there's a lot of little platforms that are popping up that are just completely reinventing the wheel. It's not valuable. Um, so I, I joke, so, so when you partner, of course you build your foundation. And then when you partner with people, I think that it's important because it's so messy out there I think it's important to have a balance of just being super broad, you know, get, getting, uh, you know, to meet different people, understanding the landscape. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, I joke about, you know, Tinder versus eHarmony, but um, you know, get to know the landscape. Um, don't just do logo exercises, but just kind of go meet people and see how that works. And as the network effect kicks in, you're going to see who gets to the top of speed dial. I always say the best way to get a job is to already be doing it. 
And so the way I've always built stuff up, I work with a lot of different partners and, and players and you know, really, really good people. And the ones that tend to get the call and you guys I'm sure have the same thing is they put in some work. You know, it's about rolling up your sleeves and doing some work. And, but I think you do need to explore and get out there and talk with folks. Uh, you know, and then the eHarmony part is where you start to go really match make and find the right people that are at top of speed dial, your go-to players for all the different parts of that stack. But by having, you know, some sort of anchor point, either close, you invest in it heavily. It's very, very expensive to build a closed ecosystem because you've got to invest that whole anchor in your own, or you attach to some sort of open effort. And again, open source is the new way to drive standards. You attach to something like that, whether it's an IJAX or an EVE or, you know, Crano or whatever, or there's projects in, in Eclipse, just find something. I'll be glad to, you know, chat with you offline. But either way, you, you want to start building an ecosystem kind of around that anchor point and, and kind of go broad, then go deep. Uh, I joke, so being with Zadita, we're going straight to Z Harmony um, in terms of how we're building up our ecosystem. It's, you know, a lot of really sharp, pure play uh, players that do good things for analytics and, uh, you know, data uh, integration and, and um, you know, have domain knowledge and stuff like that. And then we're just sort of like the rug that ties the room together. But, you know, so that's how we've been approaching it, really built on an open model. But again, you, you pick your, your, your take. Uh, too many people out there, um, I think, confuse data science with domain knowledge. Very different. Um, there's a lot of great tools spinning up for, you know, AI or machine learning or whatever. There's, th that's starting to become a little bit more democratized, a little bit more available to the masses, you know, including with the compute available. But data scientists do not know the failure patterns of machines for some sort of, you know, um, you know predictive maintenance use case or, you know, doing anything around OEE or whatever. Um, that's where the domain knowledge comes in. So we see the most successful uh, data uh, projects, you know, analytics projects happen when you kind of band the domain knowledge together with the data scientists. Um, actually, a story like the uh, a guy I used to work with um, worked on a, a factory um, project, you know, robot uh, zero downtime initiative for, for robots. I think it was Fanuc Robots. And they were doing these analytics. And this guy named Brad was like, oh, yeah, when the robot does that, it's, don't worry about it. Nothing ever happens. It's fine. Oh, when it looks like that, you definitely need that. That's bad. And so they literally like programmed the, the algorithms based on Brad's advice. And at the end, they joked, they called it Bradalytics. And, um, you know, so that's important. You got you to gotta go hand in hand with the people that, that know. And, and you guys from the controls world, you, you know, you know, you've got institutional knowledge. And that's so, so important um, to, to complement what, what folks have on the, on the, the data science side. Or, or, or you, you could always grow and, and do both. But it's just really important to understand a lot of people. The hundreds of IoT platforms, they all talk about predictive maintenance. Most of the developers have never set foot in a factory. <laughs> you know, so it's, no, 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 not the same thing. Um, just a slide that that you know I'm not trying to you know call out anybody you know it's just it's just a slide that I've used uh, even even within you know kind of the IT world to get folks to realize how the, the landscape this is it's really difficult to build a channel for industrial IoT because there's so many different players this is just more of the services and distribution side of things then you've got analytics and and you know data ingestion all the, the technologies you've got the hardware OEMs and whatnot and again you want to build an ecosystem of of, of the right players across the board. But when you look at massive, massive scale across the globe, it tends to be more on the IT side, you know, the, the people that are tied into networks and, you know, kind of bridging across, uh, you know, big divides and whatnot and, and communications globally. And so it tends to be the, the IT centric distribu distributors and the services players um, that, that have massive scale, but they don't necessarily, I mean, they're building the OT credibility, but they don't necessarily have that credibility like, like you guys would in the controls world. Um, and then you've got kind of like the IT centric GSI. So they're not distributors, but they're doing services. Uh, same thing, still a little bit more bent on IT projects. They're kind of moving a little bit uh, you know, left in terms of having more of the domain knowledge for you know, different you know, operations fields and whatnot. And then you've got like the, the, the medium to large or you're kind of medium big to large uh, OT you know, focus players, you know, OEMs, uh, SIs that have been you know, in, very, very deep into um, the OT world for a while are, are modernizing how they do things, are already kind of bridging, bridging to, the, to the right. Uh, and then you go one more click down and, and basically it's, it's really, really fragmented. It's you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of local integrators and whatnot, which have a lot to offer. Um, it's just a lot. So it's like the, the trick that we're seeing in this market, whether you're big or small, is how do you balance between the big scale plays and then the knowledge? And so you've got to find that sweet spot between, you know, IT credibility and scalability. And then of course, OT credibility, which is I think one of the most important things, those relationships on the ground, the trust on the ground. 
And so, you know, we're at, we as a company are kind of focused uh, a bit over here, um, you know, right now working with, you know, people that know their industries and, you know, like how can we help, help uh, modernize? But again, we're not in the data path. We, we think it's really important to just kind of help people do more and find new opportunities. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky balance. Uh, a lot of people also don't understand that there's problems that have already been solved. Now, granted, you know, predictive maintenance or something like that, you could do it, uh, you know, a little bit more cost effectively, maybe, but, but, you know, I mean, you guys probably know the drill. There's people have been doing vibration meters, like on brass pads for a while, like, Hey, put the vibration meter here, 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 and here, send me the data with a handheld meter once a month. And I'll tell you when that machine's got, it, got an issue. And so I don't know that predictive maintenance alone is, is, is something that, that meets the, the the criteria to add risk or complexity to uh, uh, you know a factory. Uh, but if you look at the cumulative value, and the same thing, people have been using brute force da USB data loggers for cold chain for a long time. Manual process, it could be error prone, but still, I think it's really important to think about the cumulative value. And I've got a slide on that here in a second. Um, the other thing, actually, let me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hop to it. So um, the, the other thing is, is finding a balance between um, the value delivered and the risk involved. So this is a story that, that I, uh, I like, it's just it, psychology comes in. That's why part of the reason why, you know, industrial IoT or any of this digital transformation is hard. It's actually not most of the time about the technology. I mean, I think you really have to think about how you architect things and the openness or close or whatever. It's about people. First, it's about business case. Is there a reason to add risk and complexity in my life to drive new outcomes, get new experience, make the process more efficient, things more safe, whatever. And then can I deal with the, 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 the people part? You know, there's, there's folks that are saying, hey, that's not my job. There's people that are like, that scares me, you know, whatever. But um, you've got to find a balance. So this is a story of Phil and Fred. So Fred, Fred was a, a, a we worked with a, this farmer up in the Northeast um, a few years back and he does microgreens. And when their um, heaters go out in the winter because they run out of propane, he could lose like $5,000 worth of crops overnight. And then uh, Phil was the propane you know, person that would come out and fill the tanks, uh, you know, across the farms in the region or what all the people that had propane in the region. Well, Fred would freak out if the propane was not completely full and Phil would love it to go completely dry because then he could maximize the, the, the trip charge when he drives around, you know, the region, uh, get the most out of his gas and all that and whatever. Well, we instrumented that propane tank with a sensor that showed both of them exactly how much, you know, propane you know, was in there and man, it was, it created a very interesting dynamic. You know, initially, you know, Fred, the farmer was like, oh, I don't need that mobile app. I, I know what's going on and whatever. And we found that after a little while it equalized. And when that tank was 40% full, um, everybody was happy. Like that was equilibrium. And you're going to see this in many different interactions. So as things get more and more connected, just like the, the natural world has ecosystems and, and, and things connect and they find a natural equilibrium. It's important to think about not just that you can do something with technology, it's like what's gonna to happen to the people and what, what do you need to think about in terms of those dynamics? Um, we see this, there's many examples of this. And so it's, it's, you, got, you can't forget about the people part. Uh, the funny thing though too on this one is that um, Fred, the farmer, that we went back a year later and you could not peel him away from his phone because he was just like, oh, I, I, I can play golf more, I can do whatever, you know, because I just know, like it just tells me if there's something wrong, you should fertilize now. He loved it, but up front it was, oh, no, no, I, I don't like that. Um, it was a very interesting, you know, story, I thought. So, you know, the, the net thing here is, is, is to focus on use cases that balance value and risk, but then also look at compounding value and risk. So that predictive maintenance example, you know, one thing is you could go build a solution for predictive maintenance, you know, maybe that problem's already solved. But if you look at the big picture of the whole uh, factory process, and you guys are probably, a lot of you are probably already doing this, but you look at the whole process, every time someone operates on a defective part, you just spent more t uh, more money, that part gets out into the supply chain, you just spent more money, that part gets to an unsatisfied customer, it's really bad, it impacts your brand. So looking at the big picture, how does this all relate? And this is just in one supply chain, and I'll talk about how they all start to interact eventually, and that's, a, that's advanced class. But you know, take a step back and think holistically. I've worked with partners that have initially tried to save power for folks because they, you know, like a steel mill. And, and it was, they, they, but they thought holistically. And um, in one case, they've saved so much power for a steel mill that they actually, the steel mill started to make money by selling energy credits back to the city. And so it's, it's not just about that initial outcome. It's like, how can you think and, re and change the game? I think is a, is a key part. But of course, you know, start small, but it's just kind of getting out, uh, getting out of your own headspace a bit. Which leads me to this. Um, 
I, I was with the, uh, a major payments provider, I'm not gonna name names, um, a couple years ago, and we were talking IoT strategy. These were kind of senior level folks like, hey, we, we really got impacted when Square came out. You know, that little, that little deal that sticks into a, a, a phone or a, a tablet, and it just changed how people could make mobile payments. You know, a lot of people popped up their food trucks and little pop-up stands and whatnot, you know, small uh, uh, retailers or creative you know, folks or whatever. Um, Square changed the game and there's a lot of other things and you know, it's, it's kind of really uh, a lot more flooded now, but they're like, we don't want another Square to happen to us, but we just don't, we don't know what our strategy should be for IOT or whatever. And I'd planned this and I was like, hey guys, you know, towards the end of the call, I was like, have you thought about when machines start making payments? Like literally a machine says, hey, I'm about to break and let me order a part and a tech for myself. Um, that blew their minds. And the fact that that blew their minds is exactly why Square is gonna happen again. You know, some, some other thing is you've got to start thinking about it. I mean, I've had people, I, I get the arm crossed, like, oh, I don't like you because you're going to make me change, or, you know, whether it's an IT crowd or an OT crowd sometimes. And I'm like, then you say, hey, look what Uber did to taxis in six months. You know, you've got to get out of your own headspace. Don't, don't, you uh, don't be an innovator's dilemma person. It's, it's the, if I only do what I've always done better, I will succeed. The game's changing. And this is, this is why a shared technology investment, why focusing on value, learning from others, you know, the broad and deep partnerships and whatnot, it's kind of explore, you know, and I know a lot of you guys are doing that, you know, I've, I've worked with a bunch of different, um, you know, controls players and I, you know, just, so I, I just think it's important to kind of think about stuff and get out of, get out of, um, you know, the thinking of, of you know, kind of inner innovators dilemma. Um, and so here's advanced class, you know, so that's, there's some basic tips and whatnot, but, um, yeah, I, I wrote a blog a couple of years ago about this. A lot of the stuff I've been doing in the market for about five years has been leading towards this. Who doesn't like a good Monday Python reference? But um, the the holy grail of digital, as I've said for, for a number of years, is uh, always maintain privacy. You know, make sure you don't you lose IP, you know, whatever like that, stuff like that's important. That's why you need to build security. That's why you need consistent infrastructure, make it predictable. But it's selling or sharing data, obvious resources, compute, storage, networking, energy, ride shares, anything consumable or services, your domain knowledge to total strangers. Um, complete, no one has ever met you before, but there's intrinsic trust in what you're doing. And there's ways to use technology to get that trust. And it, it, you know, it's rooted and it must have a level of open. And so this is a ways out, I get it, you know, it's, but it's the path towards this is more transparency in how data is shared, more transparency in how things connect to, that, to networks and use technology to get there. So it won't happen overnight, but if you invest in the right path, you'll get here. Again, imagine if the internet wasn't open, probably wouldn't have you know, created the trillions upon trillions of, of, of value over the past you know, 20, well, 30 years or so. So that's you know, kind of the grail longer term. Um, and, and so I gave an example of that cumulative value across a, a supply chain you know, within your manufacturing. But really what the internet of things is about, or just digital transformation in general, um, you know, get out of the Windexes, getting out of the Windexes of technology is, is how do I start interconnecting all of these different you know, domains over time? It's not gonna happen overnight. You know, the, the, the part that goes from, um, you know, I got supply chain coming in, my manufacturing, uh, I ship that out first, I designed that, that product. Then it goes out to a customer, the customer well, gets into retail, the customer buys it, the customer uses it, they go out into a city, they do all this different stuff. Um, while maintaining privacy, you know, usually people give up a little privacy, but they get value, but it's gotta be a personal choice. Uh, while maintaining you know, protection of IP, the real opportunity long-term is to start driving entirely new experiences for people by having all these different things appropriately connect. I can think of a lot of retailers that would love to get into the home, you know, but you know, Amazon's built up the trust. I, I know my UPS driver, my first name, so no, nothing against Amazon, but, but at the same time, a lot of people would like to get over, but imagine utilities, healthcare providers, you know, uh, insurance providers have so much to, risk that they're bearing across all markets. And so eventually this stuff starts interconnecting, but you know, I say that, you can't take people out to dinner fast enough and buy them drinks to build trust one by one. You must have technology to help you. And so a project that we got uh, launched, this was the last thing I did, you know, I, I led at Dell Tech and there's a lot of good people behind this and, and we put it out into open source as, as an intent to launch. Um, but if you, go, if you go check out this video, there's a video at, at alvarium.org um, that uh, uh, I won't play all the, the whole thing, but um, you'll, see, you'll see that uh, it, it talks about this notion of data confidence fabric. So I'd produce this with my team. It's a pretty cool video, it's about five minutes and it just gets into where, where we think the future is headed. 
you know, so imagine a world uh, appropriately. We do not want to connect things and, and, you know, invade privacy, but you'll start to see, you know, I mentioned the, the, the cars that are communicating through cell and whatnot, and you'll, you'll see people, uh, the cars will drive themselves, but of course, when they come to like intersections, they'll start to communicate and make sure that they don't have collisions. And you get into the, um, you know, so that's the example here, you get into the home and you'll have home stuff where it's, it's, I can have heterogeneous things and they work together, but then also, a retailer or a healthcare provider, an insurance provider could bring new services into the home and, and no one owns the trust based on this. And then it gets, it, you know, it gets into various different examples of how these things, you know, factories and energy and whatnot are, are uh, uh, interconnected. And it goes through the technical details, but you know, it's this notion of a data competence fabric where you leverage a various degree of technologies layered upon an open core. It's gotta be open at the base, it won't work. Um, that starts to drive intrinsic trust. So literally, you know, just like your, your personal relationships, you have circles of trust, you know, people that you trust, generally it's your family, but maybe not all your family. And, uh, but those are the people you tell your, your, your secrets to. And then you've got another trust ring and then you've got another trust ring. Well, that's exactly like this video. You're gonna have these different pockets of trust. And then as they collide, it's gonna create a, a boundary condition. So, you know, a lot, lot, lot more to the story, but, but you could literally have data flow through networks across heterogeneous networks that says, hey, this is what's for sale. This is what I'm willing to share. This is how much. And this is how confident you can be in this data based on how it flew, flowed through this, this network with these different technologies. So, hey, I, it's 80% confident in this data. I'm willing to you know, give this part up or, or, or share it. Do you want it? And this is going to drive entirely new outcomes for people. Again, advanced class, but um, you, know, you, you can't get there without thinking through how, how you're going to do it. And, and it starts with an open model. Uh, real quick uh, plug. We have a, 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 an event all day. You're going to hear a lot of this kind of stuff. It's a really good uh, good agenda. A lot of well-known folks in the space. It starts at literally top of the hours. So I got to hop off here in a sec. But um, you know, big names like you know, Rockwell Automation and, and Honeywell uh, Connected Enterprise and Microsoft and OSIsoft and you know, a bunch of players, both both kind of IT and OT. A lot of really cool startups, uh, well-known influencers in the space, and and just just people talking about um, you know ecosystem, you know AI. Um, uh, edge AI, OTIT convergence, a bunch of stuff. You can go check out the schedule. It's it's free. Um, it'll be recorded. So if you're registered, you can check it out later. I know it's like today. People have have have, um, have uh, things to do. But just wanted a quick plug. It's going to be a lot of really good information there today. Um, you know, based on the ecosystem. I think the end. Um, in the end, it's it's consider an open model. It's not a free for all. You know, you got to find stickiness. But by having some degree of open, you can get to that bigger vision over time, you can work with a bigger community, and, and then you focus on that value. Uh, really, really focus on the network effect. You know, that, that event, we were a startup, and there's just a huge number of people that are coming to that event, um, because we've built up relationships over the time collectively. And, and you know, that's, that's the power of the network effect, you know, in, in its own right. And I mean, I know a lot of you guys have, have the same, you know, types of relationships. It's super important. I mean, you guys, I don't have to educate you on the value of relationships, of course, but um, consider open source, focus on value, uh, avoid solving solved problems. There's a lot of solutions looking for problems out there in the tech space right now because people don't understand how things have been done for a while, but there's also often a better way. Uh, domain knowledge rules, that's you guys have so much of an important part of the ecosystem there. Um, you know, find an equilibrium between the value and the risk, um, and then focus on the comp compounding value. You know, don't be an innovator's dilemma person. Uh, get out of your own uh, 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 headspace. And then it's just start small. Like, let's, let's not be crazy. You got to go solve a problem for a customer. But if you think about how you architect, then you can, as, I, I, I needed a rhyme, so, you know, scale to the grail. And then, and then who doesn't like a good uh, uh, Talladega Nights uh, reference, a, sc a scale and grail. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so uh, I, think that's, I think that's it for, uh, for me. Um, you know, I, 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 I kind of went quick. I, this is recorded, I believe. And, and I don't know if there's any questions, but you know, I, I am available you know, offline. I, I, I had to rush through because I, I have to hop over to our event, which starts at, uh, at 11 Central. But, um, are there any questions or, you know, glad to take them offline. There's a, there's a blog series reference at the, the end. You can find it online on Zadita on medium.com um, that goes through a lot of this in a lot more detail, but yeah, I don't know. You know Sam, I'll turn so you. I'll, 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 I'll ask one question for you, Jason, then we'll let you go. Um, if we're an integrator and how would we engage uh, Zadita? Um, 
Well, find the easy way is find me on LinkedIn and send me a note. Um, you know, info at zadita.com. We'll, we'll we'll get somebody, but but you know, I can make sure to get you to the to the right folks. Um, but yeah, we've got uh, you know our website zadita.com. You know, kind of reach out. But you know, I I definitely you know really like to work with folks that are kind of looking for you know what's a what's a strategy because you know I'm a big believer too. And in, in speaking of relationships, is I don't. I don't feel like I need a, a dog in the hunt to, to set someone off somewhere. And, and even if, you know, because it, it usually comes back and pays you somehow. So if, if someone's looking for, you know, just some advice, I mean, for whatever I know, I mean, not that I know everything by any means, but glad to help, you know, so just kind of reach out, find me on LinkedIn or, or go, you know, pingsadita.com. We can do demos and, and um, you know, things like that kind of help you understand how this could, uh, what we do could aug augment what you guys are doing. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good compliment to the stuff that you guys do today. Okay. And as far as when to engage you, it's it's when we're looking at how to get data off the plant floor and get it up to the uh, cloud or up to a customer. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I think it's it's yeah yeah. Whenever whenever you're looking to create, you know, I show those touch points, whether it's a um, secure proxy or it's you know an appliance for security or some sort of compute on the factory floor that processes data locally or it sends it to the cloud or some other on-prem system. Anytime you see that sort of, you know, the IT practices, I'm not saying IT owns it because sometimes OT owns you know, the whole thing. Sure. It, I don't like the, the IT versus IT only does this. And any of those types of data analytics, kind of traditionally IT systems, whether IT owns it or not, that are kind of coming close to the process, whether it's to get data out to the cloud or do analytics, we're all about the easy button to make that happen with your choice of applications and hardware and whatnot. We run on x86, ARM, you name it. Just simplify all that crazy fragmentation because the closer you get to the physical world, everything gets more complex. You know, compared to in the cloud, it's fairly standard. You guys know the drill. So uh, anytime you see that sort of convergence of IT and OT practices happening for compute and processing, industrial IoT, and it, that, that's, that's where we're all about the easy button outside of the data center. Okay. Cool. All right. Excellent. We'll let you get to your other event. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. Care. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Sam. Yep. All right. Have a good one. All right. You too. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.